accordion. That's what I'm told, so... Yeah, I guess so. Let me sit on the end, though, just in case I gotta speak. Good morning. We're so glad you joined us today for worship. Here are just a few of the ways you can connect, grow, and serve through the ministry of our church. Our Sunday morning nursery and preschool are open for ages birth through K-5. It's not too late to volunteer. If you'd like to serve in this ministry, email Lisa Gilbert at the address below. We have updated and switched our church record software to Realm. Realm includes a mobile app that all our church members can download and use. Through the Realm app, you can manage and view all your giving, keep your family's information current with the church office, and so much more. Call the church office and we'll help you get set up. We are collecting backpacks for Appalachia until October the 15th. Drop them off at the church office. We are also collecting shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. There is a table set up in the lobby where you can get more information and pick up shoe boxes. Hey ladies, we are kicking off some online Bible studies this fall. We'll be doing these studies through Right Now Media. If you don't already have a Right Now Media account, you can create one through the church website, and it's free. Once you're set up with Right Now Media, head over to the Women's Ministry page to register. Watch for updates on our Second Baptist Women's Facebook and Instagram accounts. Second is more than Sundays. With so much going on around campus, we pray that you will find a place to plug into. Remember, as always, practice social distancing, wear a mask if you desire, wash your hands, and if you're sick and have been exposed or quarantined, please worship with us from home. Good morning. I said good morning. Good to see you. Would you stand with me? We come this morning to worship the only one worthy of worship. His name is Jesus. Can I get an amen? Or well, it's so good to see you. Thanks for being here today, and thanks for joining us by internet, too. Let's lift our voices together as we sing. We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a 
Capella to the Lord this morning. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, yes, Lord. show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. And the Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, he is here. And he is here this morning. Thank you so much. And you may be seated. God bless you. Amen. It is so good to see you here this morning at Second Baptist Church. Thank you for being here, gathering together with us. And wherever you are, watching online, across this community, and literally around the world, we're so grateful that you've joined us today. I want you first to welcome Scott Smith, Scott White, leading us in worship this morning. I did that in the first service. So it's, it's weird. I know, a, I know a Scott Smith, and I know a Millie Smith, and I know a Scott White and a Millie White. We've got the Whites here today, not the Smiths, okay? So if I can, ha if I can handle that, we'll be all right. It's so good to see you here today. If you're a guest, do us a favor. If you're here in the building or wherever you're watching, do us a favor. 
Text the word welcome to 478-324-5402. If you would do that, that way we know that you're worshiping with us. We can connect with you. We can get to know you. And we can tell you more about our church. If you would do that, we are so grateful for you doing that. And today, um, thank you for your faithful giving. You have the opportunity to give today in multiple ways. You can give online, secondfamily.tv slash give. And you can give via text. Text the phrase, my second family, all one word, to the number 73256. You can also give here today in the boxes as you leave or mail your gift in to the church office or drop it by throughout the week. We thank you so much for continuing to give during this crazy and chaotic time. And every single week we see God bringing more and more people back to gather together in worship. And we're grateful for those of you who are joining us online, those of you that have health concerns and issues, we're praying for you. Those of you that are ready to come back, we're looking forward to gathering together in a safe, healthy way, but worshiping the Lord together because there's really no substitute for gathering with the body of Christ. It's so good to see you here today. This morning is a very special morning. We have the opportunity to observe what we call parent-child dedication. We don't call it baby dedication because the babies aren't really making any decisions today. Moms and dads are saying, we want to raise our kids in a way that honors and glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. So, would you turn your attention to these moms and dads and babies as we have a time of parent-child dedication? Rylan, Christopher, Bartholomew. Parents are Ryan and Laura Bartholomew. Grandparents are Kent and Teresa Davis, Ron and Charmin Bartholomew. John Wesley Carroll. Parents are Will and Jenison Carroll. Grandparents are Joe and Gina Cooper, Peggy and Gary Martin, and the late Johnny Carroll. Naomi Kate Graves. Parents are Micah and Jansen Graves. Grandparents are Frank and Jennifer Graves and Ira and Janelle Hughes. Phoebe Henderson. Parents are Mike and Christy Henderson. Grandparents are Eddie and Wanda Self, Ardella Pearson and the late Ronnie Pearson. Catherine Lynn Hodges. Parents are Clay and Victoria Hodges. Grandparents are Mike and Dolores Hodges, Tracy Bennett, Kurt and Kathy Renz. Charlie Gray Johnson. Parents are Sean and Stephanie Johnson. Grandparents are Russ and Pam Alford, Terry and Pam Johnson. James Clinton Johnson. Parents are Clint and Sarah Johnson. Grandparents are Steve and Sheila Burpee and Clint and Beth Johnson. Oliver Robert Lauritsen. Parents are Joshua and Abby Lauritsen. Grandparents are Chuck and Anae Ferguson. Jay and Sandra Lauritsen, and great-grandparents are Pete and Laverne Lauritsen, Brenda Higginbotham, and the late Bobby Higginbotham. Harper Polk. Parents are Travis and Lauren Polk. Grandparents are Tom and Linda Graham, Billy and Emily Dixon, and Robert and Marion Polk. Mary Kate Poston. Parents are Jake and Brooke Poston. Grandparents are Tracy and Cindy Poston, Shane and Susan Calhoun.
Sean Rogers Jr. Parents are Sean and Kaylee Rogers. Grandparents are David and Cindy Corson, Heidi Parsons, and Brian Rogers. David Ezekiel Tabora. Parents are Manuel and Joanna Tabora. Grandparents are David Cho and Ruth Chang, Manuel Tabora, and Lupe Duras. Baylor Clark Whitney II. Parents are Baylor Clark Sr. and Aaron Whitney. Grandparents are Wiley and Stephanie Elliott and Brian and Jana Whitney. Isn't this beautiful? Man, just... Oh, this is church growth the old-fashioned way right here, man. Incredible. And speaking as a father of five, there are very few things more stressful than standing up in front of the church wondering what your kid is about to do as you hold your child in front of everyone. Moms and dads, thank you so much for being a part of baby dedication today, child parent dedication. I always ask somebody who has a a, a nice seat up in the nosebleed section to get a picture of this because it's such a beautiful picture. You know, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It goes on to say, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, our children of one's youth. God's given you an arrow. You're supposed to shoot it straight and far. Right now it stays in the quiver for a little while, but one day you have to pull back the bow and you have to let it go and you have to point that little boy or that little girl in the right direction. The Bible tells us children are a blessing. Sometimes in the middle of the night, we're not sure how big a blessing they really are. I know, but children are a blessing. And you have an incredible responsibility to raise them and to train them in a way that honors and glorifies the Lord. So here's what I'd like to do. We call this parent-child dedication because your baby's not really making a decision today. They don't know what's going on. You're making the decision today. You're making the choice. And what we're asking you to do today as moms and dads is to say, today our desire is to raise our kids in a way that honors and glorifies the Lord so that they'll follow Jesus with their lives. Is that your desire today? So I'm gonna ask you if that's your desire, you can say amen. And then a second, I'm gonna ask the church about their desire. Is that your desire today? Amen. Now church, it's rare that I turn my back on you because I don't know the faces you're making at me when I'm facing that way. But I do that so I can see all these parents and kids. But I wanna ask you a question too because you've heard the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. I think it really takes a church, the body of Christ, this second family coming together and partnering with these families and their extended families to train these children and raise them in a way that honors and glorifies the Lord. So is it your desire today to come alongside these parents as they lead their children in the ways of the Lord, to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that your desire? I'm going to ask you to say amen. 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 What a beautiful picture. This is the way God intended it. Would you join me in prayer? God, thank you so much for these moms and dads, the grandparents, the great grandparents that are here today, the families represented. God, we're so incredibly grateful for the blessing that you have given to these families and to this church. And we ask that each one of these boys and girls would come to know Christ at a young age follow your will and your purpose for their lives and make a difference for the kingdom of God. And may we as a church come alongside these families to help them do just that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Give them a hand, a round of applause. You guys are welcome to exit. Thank you so very much. And hats off to the babies. They did great, right?
What a blessing. What a blessing to see this and to God be the glory, church. As Pastor Jim mentioned, my name is Scott White. I've been the worship pastor at First Baptist Woodstock, which is north of here. Y'all probably heard of that church because you sent us a good preacher boy to take the place of our pastor, Dr. Johnny Hunt, when he retired in 2019. Well, I went out with him, and now I'm gone. I'm working with a ministry in the Nashville, Tennessee area, and it's such a joy. I've come today to share briefly with you about that ministry and show you how you can partner with us if you feel led. Pastor Jim, when we drove down yesterday, uh, he and Pastor Gary invited me to lead worship this Sunday and next Sunday. Now, next Sunday is dependent upon how this Sunday goes. They may cut me after today, but I'm honored to be here. And uh, part of that was to allow me to share about this ministry. But when we drove down yesterday, we stopped at God's restaurant right over here, Cracker Barrel. Can I get an amen? And we had a little early dinner, my wife and I. And everywhere we go to dinner, we always try to make it our prayer that God will open up the door for us to minister to the people who are serving us. And so we got there and she brought our drinks to us. And my wife said, uh, Alyssa, that's her name. She said, she may be here. If you are, I'm not trying to embarrass you. But she said, um, we always pray over our meal and we'd love to invite you uh, to share with us if you have any prayer requests. And boy, her eyes just kind of teared up. And she said, you know, that I'll just have a good day. We said, absolutely. And so we bowed our head and we prayed for Alyssa and we lifted her up. But then let me tell you what else we did. We invited her to church, Brother Jim. You know why? Because an invitation still works. Can I get an amen? She was so thankful that someone took time to just say, would you come? And then leaving our hotel this morning before Jesus got up, because we came over here early for sound check, we were going out and the two ladies were so nice, they began to talk to us and they said, what are you doing? We said, oh, we're in town, we're going to Second Baptist Church, we're going to get to lead worship there. Would you come be our guest? We know you can't come today because you're working, but what about next Sunday? And a lady named Amanda and her husband are coming and they have a person in your church, somebody named Tommy. Is there a real popular guy named Tommy around here? I don't know him. There's probably a bunch of them. But anyway, here's what I want to tell you. Ever since you come to know Jesus and you get saved, you can't help but share him. Amen? And don't get over that, folks. Invite people. Even during COVID, they want to know that we care. Amen? I saw your Who's Your One big thing out there, and I got so excited because I thought, you're doing that. You've always been a church that does it. So here's what I want to do. Part of my ministry time here sharing you with what we're doing now since we've left Woodstock is getting the gospel to the people of Cambodia. Here's how you can help. Watch the screens. Not so very long ago, the ancient kingdom of Cambodia was a place ravaged by the communist dictator Pol Pot. His government began an attempted and horrifying genocide, murdering and torturing nearly 40% of his own people. It is estimated that nearly 2 million Cambodians died of starvation and execution in what is now famously known as the Killing Fields. Since that time, Cambodia has tried to heal in every way, but these humble, hardworking, loving people have been deprived of hope for so long. Imagine if your children or family lived in such a place. What would you do to make sure they heard the gospel? What price would you pay to rescue those you love? These precious, forgotten, and abandoned people have no voice. But right here, right now, in this very moment, we are their voice. For nearly 20 years, the Power of Grace ministry has been sharing the good news of the gospel in Cambodia. Now, through our distribution of free radios, every Cambodian can have access to hearing the gospel in their native tongue. The follow-up visits by our Power of Grace ministry local church teams will help develop long-lasting relationships with those that receive Jesus as Savior. We believe that by discipling the next generation, we have greater potential for this nation to be rescued from the cult of Buddhism. For a one-time gift of $50, you can send a radio as a beacon of light. Entire communities sometimes gather around one simple radio to hear the gospel message as it is preached seven days a week, even reaching deep into the remote jungles of Cambodia. Please know that a simple little radio sent by you may indeed change a life still haunted with the scars from the killing fields. For every radio that you sponsor, they have a chance at the greatest gift ever known, eternal life through Jesus Christ. Did you hear it in the video this morning? Right here, right now, at this very moment, we are their voice. That's why I'm partnering with this ministry because we need people like you to join with us. Whether you do a radio or $5 or $10 or $1,000, whatever God lays on your heart is all we ask you to do. We're out in the front lobby. We have a table. My beautiful wife, Millie White, is there. 
Just picking at you, Jim. Millie White, not Smith, okay? We're out there. We want to talk to you. You can give today, check, cash, or credit card. We'll do it right here in the building. And think about you having an opportunity to get the gospel all the way to Cambodia and not even having to go. Amen? But we can send it. So would you consider partnering with us? If you're watching online, you can go to the website there, powerofgraceradio.org, and give online. Even in the room here, you can give online. You can mail in a card, or you can see us at the table. But we need your help. So if God's touching your heart, would you join us? Did you see the faces of the children on that video? The group at the end, did you saw the Caucasian guys walk up there? That's the Neelands. They travel full-time and sing gospel music. They were there last year, and that's where these video shots came from. And we saw many come to Christ. We're seeing that. And not only that, they're getting them in their churches. They're doing follow-up. So if you want to partner with us, it's simple. Just see us at our table, okay? That leads right into our next song as I think about it. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. It's called Victory in Jesus, but you got to hear it before you can get saved. Amen. Would you stand with us? The gospel's so good and it's alive. Let's sing about it today and rejoice in it. Hallelujah. Play it, man. Here we go. Anybody here glad you've heard the old, old story? Amen. Let's sing about it and rejoice.
Jesus, everybody. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Be seated if you can. How about this band? Are y'all grateful for this band up here? Come on, church. You better be because, listen, I've been to the first church of the Frozen Chosen, and this is not it. Thank you for your gifts and talents being used for the Lord and these singers. It's just a joy. Joy to be here. I love to sing about Jesus, don't you? There's something about Jesus. He's the only one worthy to sing to, for, and about. Amen? So as we sing this next song and get our hearts prepared for the message that Pastor Jim has today, just think about Jesus. I know there's a lot going on, but I want you to think about Jesus. Is he worthy? Is he the one that will get us through what we're going through? It fits so perfectly with the message today. To God be the glory. You listen as we sing this. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? Or do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made? We do. Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? Does the Spirit move among us? And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He loves. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worth?
Jesus. Amen. He is. Let's praise the Lord today. Only He is worthy. To God be the glory. so grateful that you've been able to gather with us today here in this building, wherever you are watching. Thank you so much for coming together to worship the Lord because He is worthy. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. And as we study the Word of God, remember, He's worthy. Take your Bibles, find a copy of God's Word, and open to the Old Testament book of Job. Today, Job chapters 29, 30, and 31. We've been in a series on Sunday mornings through the book of Job. And I promise it's not as bad as it sounds, okay? We've learned a lot through the book of Job. Today we come to Job chapters 29 to 31, and I want to ask this question. How should I respond to suffering? Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whether it's a good time or a hard time, the reality is that most of us at some point or another will walk through a very difficult, dark day. We'll walk through tragedy, sorrow, and suffering. So the question is, how should we respond when we encounter sorrow and suffering, difficulty in life? What should our reaction, what should our response be? And Job gives us an example in Job chapters 29 through 31, and really throughout the entire book, Job gives us an example of how to respond to suffering in a godly way while maintaining righteousness and integrity. So we've learned a lot in the book of Job. We've seen that, yes, sometimes bad things happen to good people, and seemingly good things happen to bad people. We've seen how to respond when experiencing pain and heartache and loss, and we've seen what to do when we can't find the answers to our suffering. Today, I want to talk about how we react and how we respond. And we see in chapter 29, 30, and 31 of the Old Testament book of Job, Job's response. This is his defense after all of his friends, his three friends are finished speaking. Now he defends himself. And you see a little bit of a different scene in chapter 29, 30, and 31. A little bit of a different scene. So in chapter 29, Job is looking back. And he's remembering the blessing and the favor and the goodness of God. He remembers his life before the crisis came and everything fell apart. So we're going to read some selected verses in 29, 30, and 31. So remember chapter 29, Job looks back and remembers the goodness of God. Look at what he says in verses 1 through 6. And Job again took up his discourse and said, Oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and by his light I walked through darkness as I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were all around me, when my steps were washed with butter, and the rock poured out for me streams of oil. So Job is remembering to the time before his life fell apart, And he's looking back to those days. And then in chapter 30, Job begins to look around and he's really honest about his present circumstance and situation. He says, everything is falling apart. Chapter 30, look at verses 16 through through 23. He says, and now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold of me. You see the difference already between this chapter and the previous chapter. The night racks my bones and pain that gnaws me takes no rest. With great force my garment is disfigured. It binds me about like a collar of my tunic. God has cast me into the mire and I've become like the dust and ashes. Now remember, Job didn't just lose everything. He's also dealing with with an incredibly painful sickness. We're not exactly sure what it is, but that's what he's describing. Then he goes on to say, when he prays, listen to how he feels. I cry to you for help and you do not answer me. I stand and you only look at me. God, where are you? You've turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You lift me up on the wind. You make me ride on it. You toss me about in the roar of the storm. For I know that you will bring me to death into the house of the appointed for all the living. Job says, everything seems to be falling apart. 
And then in chapter 31, the scene shifts again. And Job, as he's walking through tragedy and heartache, maintains his integrity. His friends, it's a Job, you're suffering because of sin in your life. You've been rebellious, you've been wicked. And Job maintains his integrity. Look at what he says in chapter 31 and verses 5 through 8. He says, if I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened to deceit, Let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. If my step has turned aside from the way and my heart has gone after my eyes, and if any spot is stuck to my hands, then let me sow and another eat and let what grows for me be rooted out. Job is saying, if I've sinned, then I stand before God and maintain my integrity. I'm not suffering because of my sin. And if my sorrow is because of my sin, I maintain my integrity before God. If I'm guilty, I accept my punishment. But I stand before God and maintain my integrity. It's interesting. How do you respond when you face suffering in life? I've told you before that you can learn a lot about yourself by how you respond when life is difficult. When things don't go your way, how do you act? Well, we learn a lot about Job. Job lost it all. He lost his family, his children. He lost his business. He lost all of his resources. He was one of the greatest of the East. The Bible says he lost everything, but he didn't lose his faith. In his book, The Grace Awakening, Charles Swindoll says something very interesting about the impact of attitude and perspective on our lives. Listen to what he says. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude is more important than the past. It's more important than education. It's more important than money, than circumstances, failures, and successes. And it's much more important than what other people think, say, or do. He says, nothing impacts you more than your attitude. You cannot change the past. You cannot predict your future, but you can control your attitude and your response to the circumstances of life. Swindle goes on to say, I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I respond. Did you hear that? Life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I respond. And so that begs the question we need to ask, how do I respond to suffering and difficulty in my life? How do I act when life doesn't go my way? And we learn some lessons from the life of this Old Testament godly man named Job. Let's dive in and see what Job has to teach us. First of all, from chapter 29. We learn that we ought to be reminded of God's blessing and promise. We should remember the blessing, the promise, and the goodness of God. This is what Job does in chapter 29. Now, now chapter 29, 30, and 31, this is Job's summary defense. He's responding to all of his critics. Everyone has been saying anything negative about him. Job responds in these chapters. And a familiar phrase might fit at the end of chapter 31. Job could have said something like, I rest my case. He's defending himself. But as he defends himself, he begins by remembering the goodness of God and the blessing of God on his family. You see, Job sees life in a balanced way. We always want God to send us the good things, and we never want God to send us the bad things. But do you realize that God can teach you and grow you and mature you in the midst of the good and the bad? Job says in in Job chapter 2 and verse 10, shall we receive good from the hand of God and shall we not receive evil? In other words, God's in charge. He's in control. Who are we to say, God, you're only supposed to send me good. You're never supposed to send me anything bad. It was Charles Spurgeon who said, too many people write their blessings in the sand, but engrave their sorrows in marble." We remember our pain. We remember our sorrows more than we remember the blessings of God. Here, Job is longing for the good old days. You ever felt like that before? We get a little nostalgic. We romanticize the past. Job is longing for the good old days. You know how I know? Because he says it. Look at verse 2 of chapter 29. Look at what he says. Oh, that I were as in the months of old, as when the days when God watched over me. 
In the days when God watched over me, in other words, I wish that I could go back to that time in my life when God's blessing, his favor was on me. Remember Job? Job, the businessman who prospered in everything that he did. He was probably a farmer for that entire area, had multiple thousands of acres. He had donkeys. He had camels. Most likely, he had uh, industry and businesses. He had servants. He had it all. The Bible says he was the greatest of the East. Job was a success in business. He was a success in life with his family, and he was a success in his relationship with God. Job seemed to have everything. And he looks back and he says, man, I wish I could go back. I wish I could go back to the way things were. Now, we can do that too. If you're walking through a difficulty right now, maybe you've said, I wish I, sh- I wish I could go back to the time before I lost my job. I wish I could go back to the time before I lost my health, before I lost my marriage, before I lost my spouse, before I lost my child. If I could just press the button and rewind to skip back to those days because this is too difficult. Job looks back and says, I remember the days of old. It's natural for us to long for the good old days. And it's natural for us to be nostalgic about the past. But I'm going to tell you, somebody said longing for the good old days, being nostalgic about the past, it could be a combination of a, of a bad memory and a good imagination, okay? So be careful when we want to go back, know that God is doing something in our lives now. If we want to go back and live in the past, we cannot have power in the present or any motivation for the future. Job looks around and says, this was my life before tragedy. Look what he says in verses 3 through 6. And, and listen, remember Job's life. Look what he says. When, when his lamp shone upon my head. Now that's talking about God. When God's lamp shone upon my head. And by his light, I walked through the darkness. As I was in my prime, Job says, I was in my prime when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were all around me, when my steps were washed with butter, and the rock poured out for me streams of oil. Now remember, this is Hebrew poetry, and Job gets a little poetic there in verse 6, right? He said, man, my steps were smooth like butter. I could could go knock on a rock and streams of oil would come out. Everything I touched turned to gold. Job was such a success, living in the blessing and the favor of God. And and listen to what he says. You know what Job misses? Here he says in verse 4, I miss the friendship of God. Interesting. Now in the midst of his sorrow, one of the most painful things about Job's life is that when Job prays, And when Job cries out to God, he feels like God isn't even there. One of the interesting things about the book of Job is it seems that God steps back into the shadows and allows Job to walk through this. And we know God's in control, but it's not like God's stepping in and making everything go away. Job says, I miss the friendship of God. And then listen to what he says next. Verse 5, when my children were all around me. Oh, do you remember Job had 10 kids, seven boys and three girls, and in one fell swoop, in one moment, all of them were gone. That pain, I mean, think about losing everything you have. That doesn't compare. All of his kids, gone. You know what Job says? The same thing you and I would say, I miss my kids. I miss my family. I miss feeling the presence of God in my life. Because I remember how I was blessed. Job talks about the respect and admiration he had of those around him. Look at chapter 29, verse 21. What does he say? Listen to this now. Men listened to me and waited. They kept silence from my counsel. After I spoke, they did not speak again. My word dropped upon them. They waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouths as for the spring rain. I smiled on them when they had no confidence, and the light of my face they did not cast down. I chose their way and sat as chief, and I lived like a king among his troops, like one who comforts mourners. Job says, there was a time when everyone listened to me. Everyone wanted my opinion. Everyone wanted my advice. I would speak and nobody would answer. Now, these three friends come and they're arguing with Job every step of the way. Now, nobody wants Job's advice. 
Nobody wants to listen to Job. Nobody wants what Job's got. They want to stay away. Job was mutually admired and respected. He's remembering the respect and the admiration that he had among his community. He was a big deal. Job would have been on the cover of Forbes magazine. People, he would have been the best of the best. Now everything's gone. And think about somebody. I want you to really do this now. I want you to think in your mind of somebody who you believe has worldwide success, admiration, and appreciation. It's hard to think of somebody like that. Think of somebody. So I think, I think of the late Billy Graham. Mutual respect and admiration. Even people that did not agree with his theology and his preaching, nobody could impugn his character. I, I can remember when I was pastoring in Tennessee and my dad gave me a call and he says, hey Jim, you're going to want to fly from Tennessee to Georgia so we can fly to North Carolina. I said, Dad, why would I want to fly from Tennessee to Georgia so I could fly to North Carolina? I can fly to Memphis and to North Carolina. He said, trust me, you're going to want to fly from Tennessee to Georgia so that we can go to North Carolina. And Dad told me, he said, we are going to go if you want to come, son. We're going to go to the Asheville area to a little town called Montreat, and we're going to go visit Billy Graham in his home. I haven't talked about this a whole lot because it's kind of one of those holy moments. He was in his 90s, and he was sitting there on top of a hill, in his house, big glass window overlooking the mountains. And in that moment, my dad and I, Dan Kathy and Dan Kathy's son, Kathy family, Chick-fil-A, we got to sit and we got to talk and listen to Billy Graham. I mean, probably the most famous believer in Jesus Christ, the most famous preacher of our time for sure and quite possibly in the history of the world. And in that moment, Billy Graham prayed for me, he prayed for my family, and he prayed for my ministry. A moment unlike any other. Now think about somebody like that, Billy Graham. Job is saying, man, that's how respected I was before I lost it all. Before everything fell apart, people thought well of me. They wanted my advice. Look what he says in in verses 7 through 12. He says, when I went out to the gate of the city, when I prepared my seat in the square, the young man saw me and withdrew. The aged rose and stood. In other words, when I went out there, they said, hey, let's make sure Job has a seat. The old folks were like, ooh, look, it's Job. Job's finally here. Verse 9, the princes refrained from talking and laid their hands on their mouth. Everyone listened to Job. The voice of the nobles was hushed, and their tongues stuck to the root of their mouth. When the ear heard, it called me blessed, and when the eye saw, it approved, because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help them. Job thinks back of that moment in his life when everything was going right, and he remembers the blessing of God. Can I tell you, no matter how dark the days become, we still need to be the people of God who learn to count our blessings, name them one by one. No matter how difficult life is right now, and no matter the mess that you're in the middle of, we, as followers of Jesus Christ, as people who believe in God, need to be able to remember the blessing of God. Even if life is dark right now, remember His light. Job says, be reminded of God's blessing and promise. And then he goes on to say in chapter 30, be real about your current suffering and pain. Be real about your current suffering and pain. Now, when you're walking through tragedy and sorrow, some people, even well-meaning people, want you to gloss it over. They want you to paste on a smile. They want you to pretend that everything is fine. They want you to give the good church answers. How are you? Oh, I'm so blessed. I'm good. God's good. Life's great. Listen to me. Don't do that. If life is hard, don't lie, even in church, and tell everybody that everything's okay. And we can be guilty of that. Hey, how you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? We can be guilty of lying, kind of glossing it over. I want you to have the freedom in the context of the body of Christ to share with other people, man, I'm struggling. Life is hard. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm broken. If we can't be honest about that here, where can we be honest? This is the kind of place that ought to lift up other people who are walking through sorrow, heartache, 
and difficulty. And look what Job says at the beginning of chapter 30. You can almost hear him groan those first two words. But now. I was respected. I was admired. People listened to me. I was the best of the East. Man, I had everything going for me. But now. In other words, that was then. This is now. Life's a little different now. And you can see three times in chapter 30, he uses that phrase, but now or and now to contrast what he's been going through. What does he say? Verse 1, but now they laugh at me. Men who are younger than I, whose fathers I would disdain to set with the dogs of my flock. In other words, the worst of the worst now mock Job because of his heartache, because of his pain. Verse 9, and now, that's like but now, I've become their song. A byword to them. What does that mean, a byword? It, it's, almost like, it's almost like people say, oh, now, you don't, you don't want to be like Job. You don't want that to happen to you. And Job just, it kind of became an example to others of what not to go through. Verse 16, what does he say? And now my soul is poured out within me. The days of affliction have taken hold of me. He's contrasting his life now to what he said in chapter 29. And he's being real about his current circumstance and situation. Job is saying, my life is falling apart and I don't know what to do. That was then, this is now, and everything has changed. Listen, don't lose touch of reality. If life is hard, you need to have some people in your life who you consider faithful friends that can walk with you and bear your burdens and encourage you in the midst of your darkest days. Be real. Notice what Job says here at the end of chapter 30. What's he say? Verse 31, my lyre is turned to mourning. A lyre is like a small harp. It's an instrument that's played to sing. My pipe like a flute to the voice of those who weep. Job says, man, I used to play upbeat music, but now it's only the blues. Sorrow. It kind of reminds me of the psalm, Psalm chapter 137. You know, every psalm has its own context. Every psalm has its own situation. And Psalm chapter 137 is no different. Psalm 137 was written after Babylon invaded Jerusalem and the people of God were taken captive and the capital city was destroyed. So I I want you to understand this psalm in that context. Everything is falling apart. They've been taken captive and their captors, look, look, listen now, listen to Psalm 137, the first three verses. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. In other words, we remembered what life was like before it all fell apart. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres. We put our musical instruments down. For there our captured required of us songs and tormentors mirth saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. You get the sarcasm? The psalm is saying that here the captors, Babylon, they're leading out The people of Jerusalem, they're bringing them into captivity. And do you know what they would say? Where's your God now? Why don't you sing those songs you used to sing? Sing us a song of Zion. They're torturing them. It'd be like someone walking in and taking us into captivity and saying, Hey, church, you want to sing and praise God? How about you sing now? What about blessed assurance Jesus is mine? You want to sing that? What about it is well? How about now? Is it well? Oh, way maker, you like that one? He's not making a way for you right now. And Job says it was like we put down our harps, we put down our flutes, we put down our musical instruments. Job says, I don't feel like singing. Look what it says in verse 4 of chapter 137 of Psalms. How can we, look now, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? This is what the people of God say. In other words, I'm in the midst of a mess, and I really don't feel like singing right now. I really don't feel like worshiping. And Job says, I'm putting it down. But I'm also reminded of Paul and Silas who are in chains in the book of Acts. You know what they do? At midnight, 
in chains, they begin to sing and praise God. Not because their chains fell off, but because they were in chains. The chains didn't come off until they started worshiping and praising the Lord. And then all of a sudden, the chains fall off. The gates are open, and they're granted their freedom. We have to learn to sing even in the moments of our darkest days. We have to worship. But don't be fake. Don't put on that church smile and always pretend like everything's great and you never have any problems and life is good. You're living in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood and everything's okay. Be real. And have some people in your life that'll be real with you. Job was honest about what he was going through. Be reminded of God's blessing and promise. Be real about your current suffering and pain. And then number three, be resolved to walk in integrity and purity. And chapter 31 kind of ends Job's statement here. It's, it's like Job's legal defense. This is almost like a legal document. Here's the evidence. I'm under oath before God, the judge, and I'm defending myself. And jo Job's only hope was for God to vindicate him and God to clear the charges. Sixteen times in chapter 31, Job uses a phrase, if I have, or some similar phrase. And what he means is, if I have sinned, then I'll accept my punishment, but I haven't sinned in this way. And he gives several categories. He talks about lust and impurity. He talks about de deceit and lying. He, he talks about defrauding other people or being unjust and unfair. He's going over all the list of things. He said, I haven't done that. I've been faithful. In the first 12 verses of chapter 31, he says, I've been faithful and I haven't sinned in a sexual sin. I've been faithful to my wife. I, I haven't been lusting after others. Look what he says in verses 1 through 3. I've made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? What would be my portion from God above? And my heritage from the Almighty on high is not the calamity, is not calamity for the unrighteous and disaster for workers of iniquity. Job is saying, I've been faithful. I've remained pure. And then he goes on to say in chapter 31, verse 13 through 23, he says, I'm not abusing my power as a boss. I wasn't taking advantage of my employees. I was giving them what they earned and I was taking care of them. He said, I haven't defrauded them. And then he goes on 24 to 40 of chapter 31. He says, I haven't compromised my integrity before God or man. I haven't compromised my integrity. If I have, then I'm asking God to judge me. It's like Job is giving his final statement there in the courtroom. He's walking through one by one all of these things. He said, I haven't done that. All, the, all of my friends want you to believe that I'm suffering today because of my sin or wickedness. It's not true. This is what Job is saying. He said, God is the judge, and God will vindicate me. And it's like Job can see the jury kind of frowning with their arms crossed. Yeah, Job, we don't really believe you. He said, I maintain my integrity before God. It doesn't matter whether you believe me or not. I'm standing before God. Man, you've got to be resolved to live in integrity and purity. Listen to me carefully. Two greatest tests that we'll face as followers of Jesus Christ. Test of prosperity and the test of adversity. And we need to be willing to pass both of those tests. Prosperity, it's a test. Adversity, it's a test. And make sure Christ remains the center in and through it all. That's what Job is facing, the test of adversity. How's he going to respond? What's he going to do? It's like Job kind of says at the end of chapter 31, the defense rests. My Bible says that the words of Job are ended. Another translation says, I now sign my defense. I Rest my case. Let God be the judge. Many of you may have heard the name David Gergen. If you've never heard his name, maybe you've seen his face. There's a lot of uh, commentary on political talk shows. David Gergen was an advisor to multiple presidents. Listen to the presidents that considered David Gergen a, an advisor and a friend. President Nixon, President Ford, President Reagan, and President Clinton. Think of all those presidents. This guy was an advisor and a friend to each one of these men. And you know what? David Gergen never wrote a best-selling tell-all book about any of those administrations. Not Nixon, not Ford, not Reagan, not Clinton. 
Never wrote a tell-all book. It seems that anyone that exits any administration at any time wants to write and, and, and dish and tell all the things that happened so they can make a, make a little bit of money selling a book. David Gergen never did that. He did write a book entitled Eyewitness to Power in which he talks about the importance of leadership and how to be the best leader that you can. And he says, very first of all, he has seven characteristics. First and foremost, you know what he says? Leadership starts from within. He emphasizes integrity over and over again. He quotes Senator Alan Simpson who said, listen to this. When it comes to integrity, if you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. He continues to emphasize the importance of faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity. No wonder we have such a high regard for Job now, we get to see his life from the outside looking in. I'm thankful I didn't have to live that. But as I look at him, he maintains his integrity even in the midst of everything falling apart. And what he says in chapter 27, verses 5 and 6, Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness, and I will not let it go. Job says, I maintain my integrity and my faith and trust in God. Be resolved, no matter what you face, to be a man or a woman of integrity that gives honor and glory to the Lord. Job had faith. Even when things didn't turn out the way he wanted, he looked to God. He trusted in him. I want to ask if you'd bow your heads and close your eyes here in this place. Even watching online in this moment, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The most important moment of our service right now. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you've repented of your sins and you've placed your faith and trust in Christ? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you have a relationship with him? You can know him today. If God is speaking to you, and you know for sure, you, you need to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus. You can come to know Jesus today. You can be saved to be a part of the family of God. We talk to God through prayer. If God's speaking to you, you can pray a prayer like this. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need a savior. I believe that Savior is Jesus. I repent of my sins. I place my faith and trust in Christ. Come into my life. You be the boss of my life. I want to follow you. If you're here today or wherever you're watching, there's never been a time in your life where you prayed that prayer. But you say, I want to do that today. I want to know him. I want to be a part of the family of God. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible promises, if you pray that from a heart that's sincere and pure, that you can be saved. You can know Jesus. You can be transformed. Wherever you are here in this place or watching online, you can text the word RESPOND to 478-324-5402. Right now, I want you to do that. God's speaking to you. You prayed that prayer. You've got questions about what it means to follow Jesus. Maybe you've been saved, but you've never been baptized. Maybe you've got questions about what it means to be a part of our church. Maybe you need somebody to pray for you. Right now, wherever you are, here in this place, wherever you are, watching online, text that word, respond. Somebody will reach out to you. We'll tell you what it means to follow Jesus. Now, here in this place, in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing after I pray. We'll have pastors and counselors here to tell you what it means to know Christ. You can walk down and you can say, I need Jesus. I prayed that prayer. Whatever it is, you can walk down and tell them. We want to tell you what it means to know Christ. We want to tell you what it means to follow him. I'm going to pray. We'll stand and sing. This morning, the altar is open. As the Spirit of God speaks, you respond in obedience and faith. Father, in Jesus' name, would you speak in word. Jesus, be exalted. Be lifted up in this place. We give you glory. We ask you to work. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Thank you so much for joining us for our online worship service this morning. If this is your first time with us, please text the word of welcome to 478-324-5402. We'd love to connect with you and give you some information about our church. If you made a decision today, have a prayer request, or would like to talk to a staff member more about what it means to be a cross follower, text the word RESPOND to 478-324-5402. We'd be thrilled to help you start your relationship with Jesus. 
If you'd like to support the work of the ministry at Second Baptist, there are three ways you can give to our church. You can give online at secondfamily.tv slash give. You can also text my second family all in one word to 73256. As always, you can mail your offering to 2504 Moody Road, Warner Robins, Georgia 31088. Again, we count it an honor that you have joined us for worship today. We look forward to seeing you in person as soon as you can join us.